I wonder if you have ever thought about why Hebrews 4, 12 and 13 is true, particularly verse 12. Why is verse 12 true? Back to that scripture reading, for, the word for, leaning back on the previous text in Hebrews chapter 4, has to do with heaven is our home. We're trying to go there. Disobedience will keep us from it. We must not harden our hearts as they did in the Old Testament uh, nation of Israel. We need to be believing people. There's one way to get there. Hebrews 4 verse 12, 4, here it is. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Why is verse 12 true? And the answer is because it connects to verse 13. The Word of God is alive, it's working, it's active, it is productive, it is sharp, it is piercing, it is discerning, it is doing so with such depth and precision. It is like a surgeon's scalpel to the soul. And the reason that verse 12 is true is because it connects to the living one of verse 13. There is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Jesus is the Word in flesh. And as such, He was living. He was active. He was sharper. He was piercing. He was discerning. He was convicting. The Bible is the Word in print. Jesus and the Bible reveal the mind and the nature of God. The Creator is speaking to us. He did so in the life of Jesus. He is still doing so in Scripture, the Word of God. The Word is connected to His sight. We are in His vision. We are in His knowing. And we, in verse 13, have to do with Him. That connection between God and the Bible is the theme of the verbal inspiration of Scripture. Our key text this morning is in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That is the claim the Bible makes for itself, and it does so over and over again. It is a unique book. It is a one-of-a-kind book. As Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, so the Bible is the only begotten book of God. Unique in that way. Verbal inspiration is about each and every word, not just the general sense of the Bible, not just the basic principles contained in the Bible, not just the basic morals contained in the Bible, but all Scripture, every word, every part is inspired by God. This is the plenary verbal inspiration, the plenary uh, verbal inspiration meaning all Every part of every word, every part of the sentence is inspired by God. You cannot spitball religion. You have to study the Bible to learn what it says because every part of it is that critical. Here is the basic idea of inspiration. 
the original Bible documents were recorded through about 1,600 years of time by about 40 different human pens, but God was the ultimate author of each and every one. God would allow those different individual penmen to use their personalities, to use their abilities, to use their vocabulary. For example, Paul writes very different than John. They each have their own word set, their own vocabulary, their own style, but they were under the guidance of the Holy Spirit along the way. Listen to this great text describing the process in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. But know this, first of all, primary importance that we get this, we need to understand it, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Those original documents were perfect, without error, recording God's mind and will for mankind. That process alone is a marvel. The uniqueness, the accuracy of the Bible should convince you of the existence of God. It is that unique of a book, that fascinating in its reading, how it is woven together over centuries of time by all these different authors living in different places. One didn't know the other on many occasions. And yet it so fits together that it can only come from the authority and guidance of God. Back to our key text, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is inspired by God. Scripture, from the Greek term graphe, like the word graphite, graphite of a pencil, that which is written. All Scripture, graphe, that which is written. All of it that is written, every part, every part of the sentence, every nuance of gender, whether a word singular or plural, its verb tense, past, present, future, all of those things are inspired by God. It is written with that kind of perfection and accuracy. Inspired is literally God-breathed. In some of your translations, you'll see the terminology of God-breathed. Inspiration, God-breathed, as in breath being produced when we speak. It's why we brush our teeth and gargle and eat Tic Tacs. Because we breathe when we talk and we want our breath to be pleasant. Well, the sweet breath of God inspired the Bible text. It is God breathed from His very lips. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. Profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. All Scripture, being God-breathed, is profitable, leading toward righteousness. And in the process of that, He will teach us. He will reprove us. He will correct us. He will train us. That word profitable should be compared to the same word being used in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Watch this. For bodily discipline. Now we're talking about exercise, physical exercise. For bodily discipline is only of little, here's the word, profit. But godliness is profitable, there it is again. Godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Yet you'll notice this, the gyms are full, the pews are empty. That is a visual commentary on the temporal, physical, fleshly priority of the majority of people. Bodily discipline only profits a little, but most people are more faithful to the gym than they are to the pew, 
and gathering with God's people and learning God's word. But godliness is profitable for all things. It's for the life that is now and the life which will come beyond the grave. So we ought to give great attention to that. Over and over the Bible and its human authors will claim this great inspiration from God. For example, in the Old Testament, you'll find over 3,800 references to God speaking. It'll come across in passages like this. In Exodus 17 and verse 14, the Lord said to Moses. In 2 Samuel 23 and verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me said David. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord stretched out His hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. You'll find references like that over and over and over again. Then when you come to the New Testament, you have the same sort of idea. For example, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Philip, as he went preaching in Samaria, was there preaching, Acts 8, 14, the Word of God. So you find these references, Old Testament, New Testament alike, where the Bible and its authors are making these great claims of the inspiration of the word they speak and ultimately that which is written. Then you have these two very powerful passages. One of them is in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13 and is one of my favorites. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is. Well, what is it really? The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. What kind of work? Back to our key text. It's teaching. It's reproving. It's correcting. It's training. It's equipping. It's performing its work in you who believe, who accept it for what it really is, not the word of a man, but the actual word of God inspired by the breath of God. Second passage of great importance, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. For to us, this is an apostle speaking, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? So when someone says, I know exactly what you're thinking, doesn't that insult you? You don't know what I'm thinking. You can't read my mind. You can't read my heart. You'll only know what I'm thinking when I tell you what I'm thinking. That's the point Paul's making. No one knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God knows the thoughts of of God. Now we have received, this is Paul again, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. He's describing the process of inspiration. This is how we speak, this is how we teach, this is how we preach, this is how we write. We have received the Spirit from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not as in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. All Scripture is inspired by God. And that's how we can know the mind and the will of God for us. So when somebody comes along and they say, Well, don't you think God would want this or that? 
I think God would want this or that. That's as insulting as somebody telling you, I know what you're thinking. We don't know what God thinks. We don't know what God wants, save that which He has written and recorded for, for us in the inspiration of Scripture, the Holy Bible. That's how we know. Now, Jesus will illustrate the degree of inspiration, and it is down to the atomic level of Scripture. In his ministry, he emphasized the thorough inspiration of Scripture in the Old Testament text. In Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, he said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. How much did you come to fulfill? What do you think of the Old Testament Scriptures? Here's what Jesus had to say. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. That's how much of it matters. Every little piece and part of it. King James has jot and tittle. A jot or the smallest letter was the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. The tittle was the stroke, the tiniest mark on certain Hebrew characters. If you were to look at a Hebrew text, you might see the smallest little thing that might look something like a comma. And whether it's there or not matters to the word and the meaning. Jesus said even the jot and tittle, that smallest letter and stroke, matters. It has meaning, and I have come to fulfill all of it down to that degree. Jesus made critical doctrinal statements on precise Old Testament grammar. He was once speaking with the Sadducees. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed that when you die, you were like Rover, dead all over. There was no judgment day. There was no heaven. There was no hell. You just died, and that was the end of you. Nothing to answer for beyond the grave. So Jesus had a discussion with them about that. Here's what he said in Matthew 22, verses 31 and 32. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? And now he goes to Exodus 3 and verse 6, the burning bush incident. He appears there and speaks to Moses, sending him back to Egypt. And this is what he told Moses. I am, present tense, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus remarked this way to the Sadducees, He is not the God of the dead but of the living. And even though that father, son, and grandson, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had long been dead for centuries, He announced, I am, present tense, the God of those three patriarchs. I am their God, and I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living, meaning they still exist. There is life after death. Their bodies are in the grave, but their spirit is alive in the spiritual realm. They still are, and that answered the, the Sadducees. Then again, he quoted from Psalm 110 a little bit later in that chapter to prove his own identity. Here it is in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ, about the Messiah? Whose son is he? Now, they didn't recognize he was the Christ. They didn't recognize he was the Messiah. But he asked them, theoretically, Old Testament prophecy, tell me about the Christ, about the Messiah. Whose son is he? What's his genealogy? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit, according to inspiration, David being guided by inspiration of God, how is it then that David in the spirit called him Lord? If he is a descendant of David, how can David call his own descendant down the, through the ages? How can he call his own descendant Lord? Explain that to me. 
He said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. So he quoted from Psalm 110 right there. And if David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Jesus had a dual nature, and they didn't understand it. As the son of David, Jesus was human, the son of man. But as deity, he is the son of God. And that's why David would term him Lord, God, Yahweh. That's how David could call him Lord. So that language in the Old Testament is very particular and intended. Jesus promised the apostles that when he rose from the grave and went back to heaven, that God the Father would send the Holy Spirit in his place and deliver God's truth to them. You'll read about it in John 14 and John chapter 16. The indication is this. Just as inspired as the Old Testament text was, so will the New Testament text be with the coming of the Holy Spirit to give that truth to the apostles and New Testament writers. But some people will wonder about this. What about the transmission of that text? What about the translation of that text? How do we know it's secure? How do we know that it's still in its form that is inspired of God? Hasn't it changed down through the ages? If you've ever been at a, a party game icebreaker where they played the telephone game, you know what we're talking about where you have this row of people or a circle of people and the first one has a story and the first one with a story whispers it in the ear of the second one and then they whisper the story to the next one and it goes all the way around the room and when it gets to the last person it's compared with what the first person started with and it sounds totally different and some people have wondered is that what has happened to the transmission of the biblical text how do we know it's still the inspired Word of God as it's transmitted down through the ages there's a man I want to tell you about his name is Robert Dick Wilson and I made some copies of this article I found it at ChristianCourier.com and I've got a few copies up here with me I'll leave them on this table after the lesson this morning Robert Dick Wilson is an interesting man he was born in 1856 and this is so impressive he wanted to write with scientific research about the Old Testament text and its accuracy. And he wrote a book about it. And in the preface of the book, here's the statement he makes. In my discussion of the text, therefore, it is my endeavor to show from the evidence of manuscripts, versions, and the inscriptions that we are scientifically certain that we have substantially the same text that was in the possession of Christ and the apostles, and so far as anybody knows, the same as that written by the original composers of the Old Testament documents. Now, this article will tell you the background of that great statement. How could he say such a thing? How could he be so certain of it? He set out to confirm the credibility of the Old Testament. Born, as I said, in 1856. Absolutely brilliant as a language student. And while still in college, he could read his New Testament in nine different languages. He was 25 years old, and he made this determination. I will invest the rest of the years of my life in the study of the Old Testament text with the goal of being able to speak with great authority as to whether or not it has been accurately preserved. He was going to answer the question whether or not it had been grossly corrupted across the centuries of transmission. Based upon the longevity in his immediate family background, he's looking at those preceding him and how long they lived. He figured this out. He was likely going to live to be about 75 years old. He's 25 at the time. He has about 45 years, he's guesstimating, to do this work. So he divides his project up into three 15-year segments. 
first 15 years, he's going to study every language that had a bearing on the text of the Old Testament. During that time, he mastered some 45 languages. Not only became an expert in the Hebrew language, but in all of the kindred tongues of the Hebrew language. He learned all the languages into which the scriptures had been translated down to the year 600 A.D. In the next segment of 15 years of his life, he began to study the Old Testament text itself. And if you know anything about Hebrew, you know that Hebrew text had no vowels. It had only consonants. And so he set out to study every consonant in the Old Testament text. That came to about one and a quarter million of them. And he began to examine each and every consonant making scientific investigation of the Old Testament text, compared it to other writings of antiquity, and the Bible excelled as amazingly precise and preserved. The final 15 years that he had to work with, he began to write down the results of his research, writing this book, a scientific investigation of the Old Testament, and comes out with that wonderful statement that I read to you moments ago. Now that is an amazing study of the Old Testament text. And I could give you two or three other books off the top of my head where you could begin to understand the process of the transmission of the Bible text. Neil R. Lightfoot's book, How We Got the Bible. Neil Pryor, You Can Trust Your Bible. Wayne Jackson, The Bible on Trial. And there are other books that you can have in your hand today. And to begin reading about that process and to be certain that it is accurate and it's the Word of God transmitted down through the ages, protected by the one who inspired it. The reliability of the New Testament documents is just as certain as the Old Testament. We have more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament in part or whole. Some date back to the early 2nd century, which is very close to the time of the last living apostle. We have extant pieces of Scripture from that period of time. C.R. Gregory in his canon and text of the New Testament estimates the textual variations to be about one one thousandth of the entire text, meaning any textual variations in transmission of the New Testament down through the ages is practically nil and of no major impact at all in any way. The transmission of the New Testament text then has been accurate and careful. But what about translation? What about, we have all these translations out today, what about that? <clears throat> has that destroyed the process of inspiration of the biblical text? Well, translation is nothing more than taking the biblical text written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek and translating it into whatever preferred language you have. And the way you do that is you take a word from Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, you take a word from that, and you replace it in a word with the new language that means the same thing. There's integrity in doing that word-for-word -word translation. It remains the same message. It doesn't change. The important thing is to know how your Bible was translated. So when you buy that brand new Bible, don't skip those first pages in that Bible. In that beginning part of that Bible, it will tell you how they translated it. Was it a word-for-word -word translation? Was it a thought-for-thought -thought translation? Was it a paraphrase? All of that matters. Word-for-word -word is the most accurate. Thought-for-thought -thought is a little looser. Paraphrase is just me telling you what I think it means. Know how your Bible was translated. <coughs> Read the preface there in your Bible. Was it done by one man? Or was it done by a committee with varied backgrounds so they become a check and balance system for each other?
I have another piece of paper. I'll leave it on the table up here. It is a guide to how all the translations, most of them that you would have, how these translations are done. Is it word for word? Is it thought for thought? Is it a paraphrase? What kind of translation is it? I'll leave copies of that on the table for you to look at. We're back to this. For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. If you search it, it will search you. It will lead you, it will correct you, it will protect you, and it will lead you to heaven's shore and the presence of the one who gave it to us. You will see yourself clearly and the need of your soul that only God can supply. You may need to respond to that message. We are here to help in one-on-one -on -one personal Bible study to help you get a firm footing in how to study the Scriptures and to get a foothold of where to begin and how to proceed, to teach you about God's manner of salvation and how His grace is applied, the blood of Christ. And it even calls the erring Christian back home in repentance and prayer. The Word of God is very powerful if you'll give your attention to it, it will lead you the right way. Where does it lead you today? Perhaps to answer the invitation of Christ. If so, please come forward to the front of the auditorium while we stand and sing.